After Donald Trump called for a temporary ban on Muslims entering the U.S., the topic has been widely debated on and off the campaign trail. Republican strategist and CBS News contributor Frank Luntz led a focus group of 16 Muslim Americans last night to get their take. How does it feel that your faith is at the core of one of the most disruptive, divisive political conversations in a long, long time. How does that make you feel? I feel optimistic because this gives me a chance and us a chance to tell us, to tell you guys who we really are. We're in the spotlight, we're in the media, and we haven't had this type of attention before. And we can focus on the negative or we can be positive and we can be inspiring and we can be hopeful. Frank, I think it's an opportunity for us to share a narrative. American Muslims come from 77 different countries, speak over 100 different uh, languages and dialects. We're lumped together a lot in the media, and largely the narrative is something of ISIS or someone else. That's not our religion. That's not our narrative. And I think it's time for us to take that back. I also think that it's important not to ignore the fact that all this painful conversation is not necessarily positive, even though it is an opportunity. Um, oftentimes, there are manifestations of violence of this rhetoric. Now, you said it's painful. Yeah. How is it painful? Because it's, this is, my faith is representative of part of who I am. Um, and for me to see that it has been so demonized is painful and it's scary. I actually did a call out to Muslim parents across the country to not watch the Republican debate in front of their children. Mm -hmm. Because I knew that that, uh, subjecting our children to hear the hateful um, stereotyping and the lumping of Muslims with uh, terrorism in front of our children is actually something that is psychologically impacts them. So that's how deep this is for us. But don't you want the kids to know the challenges that they face? I you don't want my mean? children to be subjected to uh, racism and the vilification of their faith. I will explain to my kids in my own way, in the way that I can speak to them, and I will not allow Donald Trump to tell my kids um, how they should feel about being Muslim. Right. How <laughs> many of you are physically afraid oh, yeah. because of... You're physically afraid. After 9-11, I was in fifth grade and I was actually slapped by another student at school for being Muslim. So I, like, as a child growing up post 9-11, I was physically attacked. That was a part of my childhood. And it's getting worse. How many of you have been physically attacked? Tell me what happened. I, when I was 16 years old, I was attacked in New York City as I was walking down the street. A man attempted to remove, remove my headscarf and I was able to escape. As a result of that, I actually founded an organization to teach Muslim women self-defense. Mm -hmm. In the past six years, this past three months have been the heaviest time for us. But do you understand why people are afraid? I, I absolutely understand to a certain degree why people are afraid. We can't hide behind the fact that Americans right now, non-Muslim Americans, do feel afraid. And why do they feel afraid? They feel afraid because of what's happening abroad and because of their safety is, is at an issue here in America. But they also feel afraid for a deeper reason. They just don't understand. And then when they see a woman wearing a hijab or a man wearing a, a topi uh, uh, after he's prayed, they become afraid. Not because of the fact that their safety is concerned, because somebody looks different. We're not chanting death to America. Okay, we don't have bombs in our hands. Okay, we're just being ourselves. And this is a narrative that's missing right now. The point here is about the issues. And I am so sick for begging love and begging attention. Like, oh, look, I'm a Muslim, I'm a doctor. I'm a Muslim, I'm a journalist. No, we're Muslim Americans. I'm proud to be a Muslim. I'm proud to be an American. And no one's going to take that away from me, regardless. So I got to um, ask you guys, how did you feel? When you first learned that the murderer in San Bernardino held your faith. I mean, every time, any, but every Frank, time that there's some kind of an attack in this country, every time that there's any kind of a crime, I'm literally praying, and I'm sure that everyone else here literally praying that it's not a Muslim. Before, yeah. before any facts start rolling through, we're literally praying that it's not a Muslim. And when it is, I know exactly what's going to happen. The people that committed those heinous crimes, they were not members of my faith. I want that to be very clear. I am not in the business of saying who's Muslim and who's not Muslim. If yeah. those people want to yeah. call themselves Muslims, then that they can call themselves Muslims. People do not know anything about Muslims. There's a Pew poll that says more than 60% of Americans have never even met a Muslim. So how do you expect the media to portray it? We don't even have someone in the media to speak for us. I mean, it's just laziness. It's like they don't want to blame a single person for something. They want to make a blanket statement over a whole group of people. So then just what should we do about what happened in Paris? There was, not a, there was not a single individual. Engage us. 
Engage us. It's, I mean, it's, it's literally us. that easy. And it's also not the it's most... The, the burden of responsibility shouldn't be on us, though. Yeah. 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 It's not exactly. why, why are you asking us this question, and why not ask white America the question? That and is where the question belongs. Who committed the crimes not in us. Paris? Not, not us. us. Not us. So why okay. do we have to speak for them? Yeah. In America, what we're largely dealing with when we see acts of terrorism, they are specifically coming from disenfranchised folks who are outliers in the Muslim community. There is a problem. There's been too many American Muslims that have uh, committed violence, and their interpretation is such that this is in the name of religion. So I don't want to be, I don't think we can um, you know, run away from that. There's been too many of these incidents. Are you Muslim first or American first? I am an American Muslim. I can be both at the same time. I don't choose one over the other. I am an American Muslim. I am both simultaneously. We will say today that Islam does not equal terrorism. But when you go outside, the Trumps of the world will believe that. They need demonstrative proof, which they will never get because folks that are Muslim are committing these violent acts. I think the American people are capable of understanding that Muslims look, look are terrorists. The... And I think something that's been missing from the media conversation, most ISIS recruits, most terrorist recruits actually don't know much about their religion before they get recruited. Granted. Usually, that's thing usually they're, that's they're very uneducated, and then they meet one radical cleric, and he defines the religion for them. You want to combat terrorism? You need Muslims. So keep pushing us out of the picture, and let's see if you can combat terrorism without our community. That's what's happening right now. Frank, as an American and a Muslim, we're your last line of defense. And that's what we'd really like to be addressed as, a line of defense that we can draw the line in the stand and say, this is where we are, this is where we push back on terrorism. ISIS has an ideology that's not Islam. In order for us to stop this, we need to get away from rhinos like Donald Trump, and we need to start looking at how we solve these problems together as America. You know, there are so many other issues besides our religion, mm -hmm. so I'm very passionate about how do we build coalitions with people who have suffered like us? But let's all come together. You know, this is not a Muslim only issue. You know, I'm an American. We are Americans here. Yep. You know, and we, we have so many facets to our identity. Yep. We cannot so. be characterized in this neat little box. I think even though obviously this focus group stems from the anti-Islamic bigotry that has been happening. I also think it's very important that Muslim Americans are invited to conversations that are not only about oh, anti-Islamic bigotry and counter-violent extremism, right? So if you're having a focus group about public health, invite a Muslim American. Or economic justice, invite a Muslim American. That's what we need, sure. diversity. Like and I think the one conversation is not really being had is what is at the root of Islamophobia today. It's not just rhetoric, it's policies. And as I keep saying, policies, policies, and we need to talk about that. What is the government doing to make a change? What has the government done that enabled this kind of bigotry? Repeating that this is un-American, that it's un-American to be uh, hateful towards a group of people is historically inaccurate, as difficult as that is for me to say, because I want to say that this is un-American. This is not what our values are. We have, we have targeted, we have discriminated against, we have um, um, grouped and generalized and prejudiced. Uh, we've had internment camps of groups before. This, this, is, a, this, is, a, this is an ugly part of our history and hopefully not a part of our future. I'm going to say a word and you can tell me what comes to mind first. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Israel. Zionism. Country. Palestine. Apartheid. Palestine. World War II. Terrible U.S. ally. A friend. Friend. Strategic partner. Occupiers. Holy Land for all. Holy Land. Uh, apartheid. Jerusalem. Racist. We're the two people who said Palestine. Do you recognize Israel? Why do you say Palestine when I say Israel? Because that's exactly what I'm hearing all the time in the media. It's like a free association, like I was saying earlier. Israel, Palestine is going to be a conflict where a conflict has been you know, raging for years and years and years that, that is, that's been also sensationalized by the news. That like whenever they go back to Israel, it's like, let's cut back to Israel and Palestine. There's like a fight going on. There's, there's no mention of other beautiful things that are happening. Like we were talking about the 17 women who were elected. I have not really seen that covered on any major news network. I've only heard of that on Facebook or the Muslim Facebook groups that I may be a part of. You mentioned Palestine. Why? Because I want to make sure that when people hear Israel, they have to hear that not territories, not occupied land, that there is a Palestine. I'm Palestinian and I want to be recognized as a, as, as a person whose family was born in Palestine. Do you recognize Israel's existence? 
Uh, I do. I just want people to understand that Palestine has to exist. There has to be a national state called Palestine. Do you recognize Israel's existence as a Jewish state? I think that Israel says it's a democratic state and it should be a democratic state. That's different than a Jewish state. I, I, it should be a democratic state because there are not only Jews that live in Israel. There are also Muslims and Christians that live in the state of Israel. Is there anyone here who would not recognize Israel as a Jewish state? Tell me why. Well, while Israel was founded um, as a result of the Holocaust and, and the Zionist movement, I, and, and I recognize that, but as a Jewish state, I mean, that's, that's denying, that, what's going on right now is an apartheid system. I've been to Israel. I've been to Bethlehem where a mosque and a church are right next to each other. So why should it be just a Jewish state? Tell me why. So I recognize that Israel exists. I do not recognize their right to exist. Israel it occupied Palestinian land. And so until they remove the occupation and everybody who lives in that space and all of the refugees and all of the people who were violently removed from that space are allowed to decide what they want to do with that land and how they want to be governed, then I would recognize whatever that became. So what part of Israel would remain Israel? It, it doesn't have to be into part. This is something that has to be worked on. It's like it's a very multi-level sol solution. It's not just that like, oh, it's, you know, going to be this part of land or this part of land. I really don't um, believe in these borders that were placed, right, over people, over villages, right? Like, then I can't recognize that. Everybody has to um, figure out what they're doing in that situation. Most people, most people do recognize the 67 borders. Mm -hmm. yeah, do, you, do you accept that? No, I don't. But not even 67. But that's not possible right now. They don't exist anymore. Logistically, yeah, not possible. Frank, logistically, logistically, we're not talking about political views or if you're a Palestinian or Israel. Logistically, with the illegal settlements, there is no way to go do the, 19, the 67 borders. And even the U.S. government, our allies across the world have said we must dismantle illegal settlements in order to have exactly. any peaceful solution in that part of the world. You can't oppressor to find a solution. First, you have to remove that oppression. What's really, what's really funny to me about this particular issue, Israel-Palestine, is the U.S. public misses out on the very serious, staunch debates that happen within Israel about whether it's a Jewish or a democratic state. This is a really big debate in that country. Yeah. It's not for me to decide that. I'm neither Jewish nor a citizen of the state of Israel. But this is a very heated debate within Israel, whether they're going to highlight their Jewish identity or their democratic principles. Well, how can Do you recognize Israel as a Jewish state? Me? Yes. What does that mean? Does that mean that I, that's what I want to see, or is that what people there want to see? I mean, that's a bit what, of a loaded question. What do you want to see? I want to see all people have a right to a homeland, Frank. And there is a historical context that we have to be aware of. You know, I grew up in a place where lots of my friends were Jewish. I'm very cognizant of the history that Jews carry. You know, so I am, I realize the fact that there is a yearning, but I also realize the fact that there was also an injustice that was done. Mm -hmm. And two wrongs don't make a right. But we also live in a world where solutions are possible. But sadly, because of politics, I mean, that's, that's a place, Frank, where for centuries you had Muslims and Jews living side by side in peace and harmony. Mm -hmm. This is a new issue, okay? This is not, this is not a, uh, a, an eventuality or a finality, Muslims you know. Muslims and Jews have not been fighting for thousands of years. I'd like to get that, like, that's clear yeah, exactly. to the American yeah, yeah. public. That's totally not true. That's actually the direct opposite of the truth. We've been living together, working together, marrying one another, we reproducing have, together have. for yeah. centuries. So what are, what are we going to do with Shia and Sunni? We pay this <laughs> as a Muslim uh, versus that's, Jews that's issue. That's 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 we need, like, a... We paint this issue as an issue of Muslims versus Jews and completely ignore the fact that there is a significant Christian Palestinian population. Yep. 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 The Muslims and the Jews have been living together peacefully for thousands of years. Europe never dealt with its prejudice of Jews. After World War II, they could have reintegrated them into European society. Instead, they plopped them on land that they had no right to give away. Do you think the Europeans plopped the surviving Jews in Israel. I mean, that's it a is, historical fact. Is, yes. Yes. So, like, they didn't want to go, but no, they just picked them up the and Jewish, put historically them there. The Jewish population so you don't think the Jewish for, population wanted to go there? Histor historically, the Jewish population asked for land, I think, it, in the former Austro-Hungarian Empire. They asked for land in Europe where they were already established, where they already knew the language. Europe said no and then put them in Palestine. That wasn't the they first choice. Do you, do you recognize a Jewish Israel? 
I recognize the very real importance that I think is forgotten a lot of the Jewish people having a homeland. I think it is very easy to forget that as Muslims, as people who do have Arab countries to go, some yeah. of us, like, excluding Palestine, <laughs> to go back to. And I, I do think that's something that's also in the conversation and I do acknowledge the importance of it, but Israel as it is right now is an apartheid state. How can Israel be a Jewish state when they don't even take care of their Jewish people? There's black Jewish yep. uh, refugees yep. right now that are being discriminated every day. They're being sterilized to this day and they're Jewish. Sterilized. Sterilized. It's the a common government fact. Is sterilizing. They sterilized. In the 1980s. Are you sure? Look at Harris. Look at, you know, times of Israel. There's discussions on The Nation did a documentary on it, how they would do riots, anti-black riots in Israel right now, and they are Jewish. So how how can you talk about a Jewish state when I don't really care about Jewish people? It's a, it's a racist state in, in certain situations. They talk about skin color. The, the conversation has to look at two things. I mean, I recognize Israel as a Jewish state. I was at Beit HaFutzot on Monday, right? But some, some of the challenges that you have is when the European powers created Israel as a state, there was a disenfranchisement of the Palestinian people. So what do you do with those Palestinian people over 60 years later? In addition to which, a lot of these treaties that were set up by, by the former world powers in Europe were never honored. What happens there? Why is it that there are reparation for Jews in Germany, but there's not necessarily consideration for Palestinians? And I think that's largely what the Islamic community has a big issue with. Why can't we have that conversation in the same context? Donald Trump's comments about banning Muslims coming into the United States is sparking debate on and off the campaign trail. You may remember last week, Republican strategist and CBS News contributor Frank Luntz spoke to a panel of Muslim Americans about the anti-Muslim sentiment in the country. We have more of that provocative discussion, including this exchange about the government's role in the rise of ISIS. Are you Muslim first or American first? I am an American Muslim. I can be both at the same time. I don't choose one over the other. I am an American Muslim. I am both simultaneously. Okay, ten things, Frank. It's, it's not yep. a fair question. I'm sorry. Are you but a Christian you, or are you American? Or whatever yeah, religious exactly. you are. Honestly, and, and that's, that's a question. Is that's a contradiction. American is my American is my nationality, and Muslim is my faith. And I can be that, and I can that's also be Palestinian answer. at the same time. Could it ever come against? Absolutely no, not. No. So I am, can't. I am Frank, Muslim Frank, and American. Frank, very Frank, Frank, America Frank. lives under the Constitution. Okay. <laughs> not under the Bible. Not under the Quran. Iran, and not under the Torah. It lives under the Constitution. No matter Islam how. and the Constitution can coexist. So there's no one here who supports Sharia law. What, what is What's your definition? Sharia law. Why don't you go back to that earlier question? Go back to that earlier question. Look, we all have to realize, guys, the folks outside of this, outside of these doors, they're not going to be able to understand this. We will say today that Islam does not equal terrorism. But when you go outside, the Trumps of the world will believe that. They need demonstrative proof, which they will never get, because folks that are Muslim are committing these violent acts. So there's one argument that folks like us should condemn these acts. But I call upon all of the Republicans to condemn them, to condemn those acts and to condemn the Trumps who speak out against the Muslims who are endangering our national security by doing so. As an American Muslim, I really want to ask my government about how they created the conditions that allowed for these extremist groups to come about, right? Like, I question the militarism of our country. I question the invasion of other countries from our country. And as an American, I feel like that's my responsibility. I think it's the wrong uh, attitude. I think that, you know, uh, you can't blame it on the creation of this stuff, everything on the United States foreign policy. I think... Um, so why is it okay for them to blame it on us? Well, two wrongs don't make a right. You, you know why? It's you know, I mean, it's, it's, gonna, it's neither it's, is it's, right. <laughs> it's okay because it's getting them votes right now. Mm -hmm. It's okay because we're doing this right now. I'm not home with my family having dinner. I'm here having to defend myself. I think the American people are capable of understanding that Muslims look, look are terrorists. The... And I think something that's been missing from the media conversation, most ISIS recruits, most terrorist recruits actually don't know much about their religion before they get recruited. Granted. Usually, that's another thing usually they're, yeah. they're very uneducated mm -hmm. and then they meet one radical cleric and he defines the religion for them. I... The Islamophobic comics that ensue after things like the Paris attack are exactly what ISIS wants because it feeds into their narrative that there is a war between Islam and the West and that's how they gain more recruits.
You know, there's one thing that would actually blame the Muslim American community on, and that is not combating the this, this policies put in place domestically and foreign. But we're always rushed to combat Islamophobia or combat radical terrorism. With San Bernardino attacks, right? Uh, you know, Muslim organizations are already on the forefront condemning these terrorism attacks without getting all the facts out. But we want to talk about terrorism today. Look at the FBI sting operations, where FBI is actually scouting mentally ill Muslim individuals who are poor, who have history of drug abuse, to create a terrorist plot, give them the money, the weapons, the plot, and say, oh, look, we caught these terrorist uh, uh, suspects. That is completely ridiculous. And I'm, I want Muslims. Muslims to speak up on this oh, issue. True. I mean, she makes a fantastic point, the idea of FBI entrapment. This is not a subject that the public is aware of. I mean, mm -hmm. so many of these quote unquote plots that are uncovered are actually designed by the FBI, mm -hmm. funded by the FBI, mm -hmm. and then they take great credit in front of the cameras. Oh, we stopped this plot. Praise yeah. be to us, yada, yada, yada. How many of you agree with him? I want to show of hands. It's true. So you think the FBI is making this stuff up? We know. Uh, there's proof and evidence. This is, it's, it's Frank, Frank, this is public. This is public information. This is not a conspiracy theory. And this is very well known. But again, it doesn't fit the narrative. And Americans on, don't want to know this. And I, yep. and back on one because thing the, I don't think the public is going to believe that. Well, I, don't let me tell you, I come from a community where there was an FBI. But I want to clear that they do. Go ahead. Well, I would just also like to add on that the FBI also preys on like mentally ill people, low-income people, people who... They um, prey on them. Yes, and, and that's pretty much how certain they prey. There, there, like there, 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 there are there, most Americans think that the FBI is the only thing that's keeping them safe it, it, from it those is. who Frank, want to. Frank. That's not what he's saying. Frank, Frank, can I just add here one thing? Go ahead. Uh, uh, back to, um, I want to say Muslim Americans, and, and we're, we're all, now we're doing the same thing. We're generalizing ourselves right yeah. now. There are Muslims yeah. that have been yes. at the forefront of civil rights mm -hmm. uh, uh, fights in this country, mm -hmm. including lawsuits mm -hmm. against the New York Police Department mm -hmm. for our wa unwarranted Black surveillance, members. passing landmark civil mm -hmm. rights legislation just recently uh, to reform the New York Police Department. Mm -hmm. But what I want to say is that we issue, these issues are public issues. There have been investigative reports. There have been policies that continue to target Muslim communities and push us to the margins of society. You want to combat terrorism? Them, you need Muslims. So keep pushing us out of the picture and let's see if you can combat terrorism without our community. That's what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. As someone who's worked with these national Muslim organizations like the Muslim Public Affairs Council, I'd like to push back on that and say that we have been on the forefront of these pushes against sure domestic have. and foreign policies. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, Frank, is, Frank, as an American and a Muslim, we're your last line of defense. And that's what we'd really like to be addressed as. A line of defense that we can draw the line in the stand and say, this is where we are, this is where we push back on terrorism. ISIS has an ideology that's not Islam. They've crafted their own vision of reality. And that vision of reality is throwing everyone else under the bus. In order for us to stop this, we need to get away from rhinos like Donald Trump, and we need to start looking at how we solve these problems together as Americans. If you want to see more of that discussion, you can go to cbsnews.com. Donald Trump's comments about banning Muslim entry to the U.S. continue to spark debate on and off the campaign trail. Republican strategist and CBS News contributor Frank Lund spoke to a panel of Muslim Americans late last week about anti-Muslim sentiment in the country. CBS News continues to roll out more from that discussion, including this revealing conversation about why some Muslim Americans don't fear ISIS. I want a show of hands. How many of you have a problem with this administration bombing ISIS? Raise your hands if you have a problem. Wait, with no. bombing ISIS. Yes, bombing ISIS. Yes. No, but it's a very simple, it is the most simple question I can ask. problems with them bombing ISIS. I don't have a problem She raised her hand. I do, actually, because I think it's an occurrence, I think that, uh, I'm kind of a pacifist. I have a very uh, strict non-interventionist foreign policy. So what are you supposed to do when they're coming after us? Coming after us? Yes. I mean, ISIS at, is explicit. They are explicit, and you don't want us. I don't want hold us. Hold on. Okay. Go ahead. Honestly, I think. Listen. No, I'm well, asking her. Hold on, sir. Let her finish. She needs, yeah. if this let her case, finish. Well, actually, show you know, respect for her. Thank you. And let her finish. I appreciate you trying to have my back, but initially I thought you were talking about civilians, but now you're still talking about ISIS, and I've sparked a thought in my mind. It's not going to solve anything. 
You're not going to, how many years I've been, I was born in 93. My whole entire life, we've been in a time of war. Never in my entire life had I ever heard of a life where the United States was not at war with anyone else. ISIS does not have the capability to destroy America. Our military spending is better than the next seven or 10 countries combined. I'm not scared of ISIS. I'm not. I'm scared of my government, actually. I'm more scared of gov my government than I am of ISIS. Are you more scared of your government than ISIS? Yeah, and this goes back to my previous point, um, talking about just race and being Muslim in America. I, I feel like every morning when I wake up, am I going to be mad because I'm black in America or am I going to be mad because I'm Muslim in America? Because the people, the people, the people who are charged to take care of like I teach seventh grade science. So like I teach these kids who I'm seeing already in their eyes, they're like, uh, they, they, they're being told to be socialized in a certain way just so they don't get, you know, brutalized by police officers. I see that their minds are being warped in different ways so they'd have to, like, act a certain way so they don't get, like, you know, yeah. killed in the streets. And that's just that's heartbreaking every single day to see a kid. I had a conversation recently being like, why don't we give police officers tranquilizers? Because at least if they're racist, we'll make it to the car. That's just heartbreaking oh to hear gosh. a 12-year-old say. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm a little bit more afraid of our government, like she said. Like, ISIS is a small faction. Are you more afraid of your government or Absolutely. if ISIS? I'm, I'm absolutely more afraid of my government. My government has not taken any measures to ensure my security as an American. Instead, they have targeted my community and my faith and me. They have created a culture and climate of hyper-paranoia that targets Muslims and makes me feel like I, I'm afraid to be an American walking around on the street. Why, isn't, why aren't white people afraid? Why? Their government has protected them historically from any racist laws. They are not being surveilled. They are not being monitored. They're not being evaluated. They are not being targeted. Not just domestically. I mean, I, t I agree with a lot of what, she, what she's saying, but, but I'm also worried about my government's policies abroad, which we've already touched upon. But the fact that our solution to every problem is to bomb it away, I mean, yeah. that's absurd. And it's been created. I mean, this, there's so many studies we can talk about, but creating a cycle of violence where you're responding to violence with violence has been happening for decades, and we're living the repercussions of that. I, I was, I'm afraid of neither. Um, <clears throat> I think there's there's a boogie band syndrome that's being exploited exploit being exploited here by top politicians like Donald Trump definitely and it's very clear that people are afraid because of uh, these incidents and they you know they'll, they'll the politicians will prey on this and say yes we'll keep you safe we'll bomb them we'll bomb them you know it's just it's just silly right as, as a muslim yeah. and white passing as a muslim yes, republican as a Barack white male, Obama, no offense but it's different for people who look like me. It's absolutely different. No, my wife, my wife is not walking around in fear. I mean, she doesn't cover her head, but you know, I mean, it's, it's different. It's, 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 it's still it's, different. I, I already, I already agreed with you guys that no, I mean, there, clearly there's a lot of attacks, but I agree with Linda's point that there is, uh, if you look at the statistics of it, this fear is irrational, right? Because there's more, uh, you know, attacks committed by white supremacists by far. Uh, well, since 9/11, than uh, Muslim irrational radicals. Irrational so it's in it's it's in it. Not your fear. Not your not your fear. Right no, no. Not, I, I'm talking about that that specific fear that's out there in uh, let's say you know uh, uh, America at large. Uh, that Muslims are uh, ISIS is going to kill us. ISIS is the boogeyman. So it happens. You know this is a, this is this happens. I will say what I do is I'm prepared because I know what's going on. For example, if I'm going to the airport, I get there early because I know my name is an Islamic <laughs> name. It might take me a little bit longer to go through the process. Things like what's that. What's your first name? El Hajj. So, so that's the most. That's 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 the OG that's Muslim the name. Like yeah. you, you earned that name. You know. So um, yeah. So regarding that. In that aspect, like when it comes to politics, there always has to be a bad guy. In the Cold War, it was the Russians. Now we graduated to the Muslims, so we're the new bad guys. <laughs> you know, they 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 progressed. That's the the, the Muslims are the new bad guys. Quote unquote. Right. Right. So that's how you get votes. You know, it's fear mongering. The new boogeyman. Uh, that's I also it. Want to add on that you know, the way this conversation is framed is that, like, you're just kind of asking us a lot about, like, ISIS and foreign policy when really Muslims care about so many issues going on domestically. Exactly. We're fighting for economic justice. We're yep. fighting for immigration justice. Absolutely. We're fighting against police Social brutality justice. because every single facet of our community is, fa is facing that at this moment because of how diverse we are. Yep. So the fact that this conversation is only framed around a certain kind of... Um, you know, rhetoric is, is kind of going into that, that when people are watching this, they're only thinking that this is all we yeah. think about. Actually, we care about a lot of things and a lot of issues with our own country. Because we, we are American and we're not just defined by our religion. You know, we work for, you know, uh, people who can't afford, you know, 
healthcare. We work for people who can't afford to go to good schools. We work with people who have been abused, you know, who've been raped. You know, there are so many other issues besides our religion. Mm -hmm. So I'm very passionate about how do we build coalitions with people who have suffered like us, but mm -hmm. let's all come together. You know, this is not a Muslim only issue. You know, I'm an American, we are Americans here. Yep. You know, and we, we have so many facets to our identity. Yep. We cannot so. be characterized in this neat little box. And, and several of you have said that there is a real problem of racism in this country, correct? Yes. yes. That it is significant. Yes. How significant? What percent of the white community is racist in oh your mind? God. This is your shot. This is your opportunity. 99.9%. 99.9. Yes, if it's not overt, if it's not overt, it's, it's, not overt, it's internalized. So if it's not overt, it's internalized. And, and I'm not saying that it's a bad thing. I have, I have uh, in-laws who are actually white. My, my in-laws are white. And they're racist. They can hold racist beliefs. Yes. But, but let me say this. Racism is a system. Racism is a system, not necessarily on an interpersonal Racism level. Racism has no color. You know, it's so to that point, yes. can I, Frank, to the yeah. point that's been made, okay, one, as a fun statistical check, the 30% is actually 30% of registered Republican voters, and that's like 30% of the population, so it's 6% of Americans, roughly, mm -hmm. give or take some change. Um, the other thing is everyone has internalized racism. Like Everyone. You're, Everyone. You're, you're, you're right into it. Your world is racist. You're taught racist messages. It's really hard to undo it. Yeah. What percentage? of the white community is racist? I'd say 100%. 100%. The reason why I say that is because, you know, it's nature versus nurture. It's not, we're not racist by nature, we're racist by nurture. And these things are, these are images that are, even if you're in the most gated of communities where you're raised by only the people that you're around, you still have ideas of everyone else that you come in contact with. And even if you don't have those ideas of people you come in contact with, the media also filtrates those things into you as Frank, well. So what percentage of the black community is racist? I would say that, the, I'd say 100% too. But let me say this, black people cannot, cannot be racist. Be racist. They can't the be reason racist. why I'm saying this is they because be I think that they, I can, I can say that they can buy into stereotypes and prejudices because these are things that people do. They overgeneralize. They see one person, like I don't walk into like a school and I see a white teacher, I'm like, he could shoot up all my kids. Like, that's, that's not what happens in my head. Right. However, these are free associations that do exist, and that's what's happening with the Don't Muslim you community. Don't you guys think you're just painting oh, the, the entire white population I, with a brush? That's what they're doing to us as Muslims. This I, is. I, I'd, I'd hate. I'd hate for tomorrow for a soundbite to be used that 100 percent of white America is racist. I certainly don't believe that. Institutional or not, they're, but I'm not they are the ones. This isn't a matter them. about. Look, can I just? This isn't a matter about power. Yes, if you is. say that 100% of whites are racist, then you're painting the entire population that, are, that is white with a brush, just like they're doing how, us how today. How do you define racism? You know, this is the one Muslim American, one, one Muslim American that I want. So you're saying one, today is racist. That's what one, you're saying? Everyone and everybody here that is white is racist? We're saying everyone. It's subliminal, it's subconscious. Hold on, guys. It's my turn. Let the woman Actually. speak. What I was going to say earlier is that I think that every Muslim American should follow one Muslim American hero, and that's Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali, for example, didn't beg people to love him. He didn't beg the Republican Party, look at me, I'm not a terrorist. He loved himself. And that love spread throughout the entire country. He made a name for himself, not by working for the system, but fighting for the system. And that's what I think Muslim America should be about. And some of his strongest statements and strongest relationships were done with the white community. We're not saying to the white community, you are racist. No, no, some of his not. closest friends, not just in business, but in life, were white. But he criticizes white oppression, though. He said, Mom, why are Jesus always white, blonde hair and blue dyed? Why is angel food cake white? Why is devil's food cake black? He criticizes the racism in that country. He criticized. He also refused when journalists would call him Cassius Clay. He said, no, I will not respond to that name. Call me Muhammad Ali. He the taught us that black is best, no, that being a Muslim is best. And that's what I'm talking about. I'm sick and tired of everyone saying, but, oh, but, we can't say that white people are racist but, but or not people, racist. But people watching this are going to say yeah, that Muhammad Ali first the world. Wake up and realize it. That's real. Challenge yeah. your own so, so that's real. So, so, you, so you agree with what he says? 
what, with what Wu says. What, with of, with, with what, what Muhammad Ali says. Yeah, because a lot of things just for granted in the world are if it's light, it's good. If it's dark, it's bad. It's just like, it's not, it's not even just simple. Like, this is even a neuroscientific study. When you see faces of darker colors, mm -hmm. people, even people of color, will see faces that are darker and have a, have a reaction but, but Frank, to it. Frank, if I can recap, there is a discussion happening here that I don't think anyone in America has seen before. And that is that, yes, there is racism in, in white America. Yes, there is racism in black America. And yes, in Muslim America, there is also racism. And that racism is a more complicated racism than white racism and black racism together. And all of these things need to be looked at in context if you're going to start having this conversation. Mm -hmm. So yes. how, then how do we address it? But Muslims speaking here today about white people being racist, it, that includes white people who are Muslims. That includes you? It includes me. Um, and how does that make you feel? It, it like, because Muslim, the Muslim population is now feeling this type of oppression, before we were under the radar, no one really noticed us, no one paid any attention to us. We never had to address issues such as um, gender inequality, race inequality, LGBT issues inside the Muslim community. But now that we are feeling that oppression, we are able to identify more with our um, brothers and sisters who um, are diverse within our community, and um, we're able to understand these systems of power and um, unite amongst ourselves in order to fight against those systems of power. And Frank Luntz joins us now to talk more about this panel. First question, what surprised you the most about this experience? The level of fear that they feel. So we're all focused on fear from the 99 or 98% towards the Muslim community. And they're afraid of the other 98% of America. And they feel that it's being generated by politicians. They feel that the media is playing into it. They're angry about it. They want to emphasize that they are Americans, that they are American Muslims. They're not part of this religious uh, extremism that uh, people are so afraid of. And they really don't like Donald Trump because they think that he is causing so much of this anger and animosity to them. And they're begging you all to tell the truth. Hmm. But so they think he's causing it. They don't think that he's necessarily tapping into feelings that already exist. Now, a significant percentage of these people feel that the level of racism directed at them is close to universal, if not universal. I had several people tell me that all whites are racist and that it's not necessarily that they mean to be, but this is just how we've been raised. So this is deeper than just about a religion. Mm -hmm. And the frustration that they have is based on they're not being heard. Look, this is the first time that anyone's done any kind of conversation with them. You might have an individual discussion. You'll have one token Muslim in some focus group. Why is that? Because they don't represent a significant portion of the electorate. Uh, well, first off, they're hard to recruit because they, they tend to live in cities. Uh, second is that in many cases they don't want to participate mm -hmm. because they're afraid of the ramifications. I never expected to hear the fear that I did. And now let me be candid with you. I didn't push them as hard as I normally push a focus group. And it's because they express so much fear and concern about the bias against them, about the discrimination against them, that I didn't want to set off any alarm bells. I didn't want to play into what they're already concerned about. And so it caused me to interact with them a little bit differently. That, what that, would you have said yeah, then that you didn't say? You, you refuse to take responsibility for those who commit crimes in the name of the religion. And I did push back on that. And their response was that they're not Muslims. They may be saying that they're doing it in the name of the religion. And then I asked them about Saudi Arabia right. and how women are treated there. And I had hardcore feminists in this group. Mm -hmm. She's one of them. Mm -hmm. And she will take a backseat to no one. And she said, it's not about the religion. It's about the government or the interpretation. And that in this country, none of that applies. So we have stereotypes that, that they challenged that's not actually happening here in America. That's really fascinating. And I found it also interesting when they talked about what, you know, whenever you hear about a shooting, how they say to themselves, please let it not be a Muslim. Please let it not be a Muslim. I know that's a conversation uh, that a lot of African-Americans have had, you know, especially when they, we were dealing with sort of gun crime. Please let it not be an African-American. So I sort of understand that feeling. But I wonder if after thinking, please let it not be a Muslim, did they talk about the conversations that they have in their house? Not really. Hmm. They wanted to emphasize the not 
every time I start talking about issues with the religion, they would talk about issues with American society. So they would push the conversation. And, and they may not, I mean, I wish they were here right now, because that's the one thing that I should have made them absolutely mm -hmm. answer. But their communication is just as important. If, you, if, you, if we look at them, because they look different, if, if they uh, have uh, a headscarf, uh, if they have darker skin, they believe that they're, that they're victims. And yet so many Americans believe that they're perpetrators. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's interesting. I want to go back to the responsibility issue. <clears throat> and first of all, I'm kind of surprised, Frank, that you did not push them harder, that you are saying you didn't, because first of all, doesn't that play into the very narrative that we've heard from the Donald Trump, from others who say, for instance, the Obama administration is unwilling to call this radical Islamic terrorism. Oh, they're mad at him, by the way. They think that he has perpetrated discrimination President as well. Obama. President Obama. How? That he hasn't done enough to prevent uh, violence against the Muslim community. That he's bombed, that he's killed as many Muslims as uh, George W. Bush did. And that many of them resent him too. Most of them are Democrats. But they're not happy with President Obama either. Uh, does it play into the narrative? I don't know. I just felt that it was more important to hear their voice than it was to have an argument with them. And I think that we've had so many arguments over the last 12 months, maybe we should stop arguing a little bit and listen a little more. So it's interesting you say that they are not fans of President Obama because when he made that Oval Office primetime address earlier this month, he said, in addition to calling for tolerance and um, talking about tolerance and, and not taking out anger against Muslim Americans, he said that does not mean denying the fact that an extremist ideology has spread within some Muslim communities. This is a real problem that Muslims must confront without excuse. So what did they say? And their response to that is, but that just feeds on Trump. It just feeds on the anger. It feeds on the fear that you're saying that it spread. This is not part, they would argue that this is not part of their religion. This is not part of their community. This is not part of America. That this may be happening in the Middle East, but it is not happening here. So did they offer a remedy? What, do, what would they like to see happen? First thing is they just want to be heard. Second is they want to be treated as well or as badly as everyone else in America. They just want to be treated as Americans. And third, they talked a lot about social justice. But again, that's part of the political. We had two Republicans in the 16, and the two Republicans were uh, rather criticized by the other people around them. So we had that kind of mm -hmm. typical left-right battle. I don't know. I'm not optimistic. I'm not optimistic because it's just another group, another example of division, another example of anger, another example of anxiety. Mm -hmm. And instead of addressing it, we're just making it worse. Uh, so I, I'm struck by what you said at the outset, that some of these people, all of them, some of them believe that all white people are racist. Yes. Do they not see sort of the contradiction contained therein where if they don't want to be treated differently and stereotyped, then they themselves should not engage in stereotyping? Next time I'm going to have you moderate the group. <laughs> I'm just asking. And, I, and, and the thing is, I, because there are different cuts, we're actually going to later this afternoon, which is important, we're going to add to the video on what, what viewers just saw so that the CBS is actually deciding that it wants to release more and more and more of it. Can it get better the more of these you have, you think? Uh, I think it can get better because if you understand that the beginning of solving a problem depends on understanding that problem. And I do believe that listening helps you understand. Mm -hmm. All right, Frank Lentz, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure having you here. Thank you. Thanks.